What is it like sort of toggling between doing work that really is more deeply sort of who, what, when, where, why, you know, uh, and then work where you're, both you have the space on the page to do it, but you have this sort of creative and almost ethical ability to sort of get larger, and I'm wondering about that from your point of view. The short answer is I don't think I did it very well. The reason is uh, when, you're, when you're trying to commit daily journalism, you're so focused on uh, telling the story of the moment. And even if it is, a, it, even if it is sort of more narrative-driven, long-form daily journalism, um, your, your focus uh, and your aperture is very different than if you uh, have a, uh, a more literary project mm. in mind or something that you're, 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 seeking to, um, you're seeking to find those telling details. And you know, yeah. in, in hindsight, I, I, you know, I, had, I, was in, I, I was in Baghdad for six months before US troops uh, rolled in and then for about two years after. And I had this phone call with my foreign editor at the time uh, about three weeks after the statue of Saddam Hussein was pulled down and I was on a satellite phone. It was a sweltering evening. You could hear sort of gunfire off in the distance. It was a scratchy connection. And I was very excitedly talking about, you know, yeah, there's still looting going on here and buildings are burning and the Shiite clergy's, clergy's rising up there and their insurgents are attacking out and on bar, prattling on. And um, he just very patiently listened to me and then said, you know, Rajiv, in all of this, don't lose sight of the Americans who came to transform this country, who are coming to transform the country. Uh, and don't lose sight of how they will be changed too. Think back to the best literature and reportage of the Vietnam War. Best it was, and brightest. And it wasn't like about that, yeah. the Vietnamese, it was about the Americans and how the Americans were so transformed. And mm. I thought he was, an, I thought he was, he thought it was a nutter. He was sitting there in the comfort of his air-conditioned office in Washington. Yeah. Uh, here I am in Iraq. But I would later uh, sort of break from a lot of my fellow journalists and go in and visit this place called the Green Zone, which was yeah. you know, the, the headquarters of the American Occupation Authority. It was this otherworldly place in the Marble Wall Republican Palace where young you know, neoconservative kids uh, had come from Washington in their pressed khakis and their polo shirts and you know were doing things like yeah. you know focusing on rewriting the motor vehicle code in Iraq or trying to bring no child left behind education policy to the country uh, you know kids who had no experience other than you know having been you know their daddy was a campaign donor right. um, you know we, we sent over that 24 year old kid with no right. background in finance to open the stock exchange in Iraq and I um, how that go, in, by the way? Uh, <laughs> swimmingly, <laughs> swimmingly, <laughs> my friend, Wonderful. as you might expect. But you know, when I came back and I said, I'm going to write a book about this, I wrote this sort of sprawling proposal. Um, you know, Sonny Mehta at Knopf looked at the whole thing and he saw the paragraph in there about the Green Zone and said, that's what this book should be about. Yeah, he's smart. And, yeah. Um, and that's when, and, and, and a very smart editor at Knopf, you know, urged me to read some more Kapuscinski. And so, I remember, you know, reading Another Day of Life, which I, which was my, this is before Kapuscinski was debunked as a fabulist, and. But we know, can talk about that, because I, I don't buy that. I think that's just short-sighted factoid nerd, but we can talk about that in a moment, yeah. But so you, we have this book, and he's, he's oh. there in Luanda, in the height of the Civil War, you know, as a Polish journalist from the, you know, back then on the other side of the Iron Curtain, uh, and you can, you can, um, you know, he's embedded with the Marxists, and he can, you can, you can, you can taste Luanda on your tongue yeah, from the opening so pages good. in that book and thinking to myself, boy, I wish I had done Baghdad differently. I wish I had, you know, been like the, you know, the rumpled Polishman in a suit with an attache case descending upon the green zone and going to spend, you know, just a full day with the shuttle bus driver from Kansas, you know, listening to classic rock on the radio as he was shuttling people around the green zone and just told his story. So I felt like I was trying to do some of that and some of that in a reconstructive way, yeah. but um, uh, you know, it, it is it is it requires this discipline if you're not coming to it, perhaps from the perspective you are from well, somebody from my world to try yeah. to isolate and and focus on that. I'll way. tell you, it's, it's interesting. I had an interesting conversation with um, uh, two really good 
colleagues and friends of mine who are uh, really um, successful British and really fine British playwrights, it's separate conversations with them this summer. We went out for drinks after they saw Oslo, and they who are both Jewish, both, and they both said to me because you know the, in New York the the tensions and worries around having a play about with the PLO and the Israeli government get to lay bare in the most raw sense their grievances to each other on stage in the Upper West Side of New York is 180 degrees diametrically opposed from the tensions of that done in the middle of London, right? Oh, by the way, how did that go for you in New York? Well, I mean, I won the Tony, so I guess it worked out. But no, I'm being flippant, but it was interesting because... Well, before you won yeah, the yeah, Tony, no, before I'm the being thing flippant, opened. I'm being to we, we, I was really nervous. I mean, um, we had uh, active shooter policy meetings for the cast. We had safe words and codes of lockdown, you know. And, you know, six months before we opened the show in the off-Broadway space in Consenter, there had been the near riots at the Met on the other side of the plaza over the death of Klinghoffer. So, to his credit, Andre Bishop, who runs Lincoln Center, was, was pretty chill, and everyone else was chill, although I was very nervous, until we did the first run-through when the scene happens when the characters are playing, and if you don't know the play, which you, many of you sure don't, but um, one character, when they're drinking, be, who, who's a storyteller, becomes Yasser Arafat, and his nemesis in the play becomes Ichak Rabin, and they go at each other. And we did this, and you know, the magic of the theater is, is that kind of moment. And you know, we, d we ran the first time, and the director and the stage manager looked at me and went, you know, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I've been telling you people! <laughs> this is serious! So we, you know, we <laughs> then ran around and like chickens with head cut off. But it, it was sort of fascinating, because none of that happened. And the play was, was you know, sort of successful in a way that transcended even one's own e egotistical expectations. You know, you're just trying to do good work, and if you're a serious theater artist in the United States of the 21st century, being on Broadway is just off the table, and you don't worry about, you know, you're just doing your work. Um, so, in this case, I think, you know, we had the, when anything is su really successful in a fictional form, I think some of it is the quality of the work, but a lot of it is just the luck and the timing, right? So we happened to open a play off Broadway, and, and in the seven months we waited before we went to Broadway, because we had to wait for all the actors to be free again. Um, Brexit happened, the US election happened, and by the hair's whisker, right, the Fifth Republic in, in France almost fell. And all of a sudden, a play that would, was rigorously only about Israelis and Palestinians or Norwegians in the early 90s was such an embarrassing, obviously, parable about Democrats, Republicans, you know, that it was, I almost rewrote the end of the play because it was too on the nose. And so all of a sudden, the audience is bringing this profoundly emotional experience that was profound to watch, but a lot of it is just, it was not me. It was what we, you know, that's when the theater works and people have a hunger and they're coming to be told a story because they need to hear something. So we do that, then we go to London, and we, again, we're hunkered down, a bit, you know, expecting, because in London, the political atmosphere about Israel-Palestine is 180 degrees different, where in New York, whether your, whatever your emotional, religious, or political feel, feelings or thoughts are about this, the Palestinian voice is absent. It has no power. It has no conversation. And, and, it, and in um, London, it is, you know, basically nothing but, but quote-unquote, to begin, to be flippant, not to take sides, like, all Palestine all the time. A flipped entirely. Completely flipped. And so we're waiting for a different kind of blowback, which didn't happen. So that was very moving. Um, but, and this is what's among many things about what's so extraordinary about the theater and it makes it different from film and television or prose, is that it's, <coughs> it's always changing. Every performance is different. And I, you, know, you know that as a theater artist, but this play was the sort of petri dish of that experience for me, because you had what I expect will be a unique experience in my career where, well, you know, I've had a play done at the National Theater, like Blood and Gifts, done on an epic scale at the National Theater, extraordinarily, and then done in a more intimate, and by intimate, you know, still 350 seat house, but compared to London, intimate production of Blood and Gifts with a different director, different actors, different cast in New York, and, you know, having this blessing, these two crazy great shows, but, uh, you know, are so different. But here what we're doing with Blood and, with Oslo, s we do a production in New York, we uproot the production, we move it to London, the cast has changed, which of course is no small thing, but the costumes, the set, the choreography, the, the playwright, the director, the lighting, the, the everything is exactly the same. And the play is in some ways completely different purely because of the audience. So, and in hindsight, I look back and go, oh, so we did this play in New York City, and, and if I was, 
not for political reasons, but for aesthetics reasons, as I do for anything I'm writing. I don't, my role is to be, you know, what Yeats said about, I think it was Yeats said about Shakespeare, his this genius was he left no fingerprints. So you're, I'm always trying to make myself absent from the work. Like, you couldn't say, that's JT's voice, you know, or that's the JT character. You want to be in all of them, none of them at the same time. But at the same time, you're watching in secret, you're like, God, you know, it feels like, I guess it didn't really work. It's, in some ways, it feels a little too slanted toward the Israeli point of view. Well, that's just your failing as a writer. Then you go to, to London, it's the opposite. Yeah. And people who saw the play in New York came up in London and said, oh, I love how you beefed up the Palestinians. Like, the real, their arguments are so much better now. I'm like, I didn't, and I just go, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, didn't change, I didn't change a word. It was the collective interest in the intelligence of that British audience and their collective point of view that altered the play. And similarly, all these Norwegian diplomats you know, who just couldn't believe that a play about Norwegian <coughs> diplomats was being done on Broadway. Um, we did a special performance for the UN, for a thousand members of the UN, and they just sat there for the first 20 minutes and nobody laughed, and I was just horrified. <laughs> and I realized they were just so stunned that they were like, this is really on stage? You know, what we do is on stage? So this group of them came and saw the play in London as well, and I went out to drinks with all these, you know, sort of hoi polloi of the European um, uh, diplomatic corps. And they all said, oh, I love it. Just, it the nuances and the rewriting and the, the Norwegian characters are so more interesting now. And again, you know, and of course you're like going, what, you didn't like it before? <laughs> but what it was was the actors in, both, I mean, both casts were extraordinary, but the actors in New York were Americans. And the actors in, in um, London were Euro-focused, you know, uh, intellectual liberal Londoners. And they just, in their bones, connected more with those people. And, and so, you know, and it's just, it's endlessly fascinating to sort of have that uh, back and forth.